Everyone, I am so excited to share the new sub series under Trips and Global on Wheels Podcast Hour with you. So, this new series is called Environmental Issues from a Disability Lens, and we launched it today. And our very first guest is Eric Soheim. So, Eric Soheim is a well known global leader on environment and development, as well as an experienced peace negotiator. He served as a Norwegian Minister of Environment and International Development from 2005 to 2012. Eric has been the chair of the OECD Development Assistance Committee, the main body of the world donors, as well as executive director of the UN Environment. He led the peace efforts in Sri Lanka, Myanmar, and Sudan. Currently, he is senior advisor at the World Resource Institute and governor of the Global Coalition for Green Built and Road, and serves as the CEO of Plastic Revolution Foundation. So, without further ado, let's listen in on our conversation with Eric Soheim. Eric Soheim, welcome to the Trips and Global on Wheels podcast hour. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be asked to participate. Of course, it's, I know you have such a busy schedule, so it's such an honor to have you join us. So, my co host, I see Jean Mishnah has joined us. Um, Jean, do you want to do a self introduction, your name, where you're joining us from today? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, Eric and me.、Uh, glad to be with you today. It's a real pleasure to talk to you、um, today,、uh, which is actually my night because I'm in Melbourne. Uh, in Australia, so、uh, it's、uh, oh. towards midnight. But、uh, as you can see, I've taken a nice screenshot of,、uh, of the city that I'm calling from、uh, wonderful Melbourne.、Uh, and、uh, yeah, it's again just、um, a real pleasure to talk to you. So,、um, brief, a brief background、uh, I work in a technology company.、Uh, we're doing things to try and make the world a paperless、uh, experience. So, taking paper away from、um, your day to day. Uh, work needs or、um, any type of other design requirements.、Uh, so, we're, we're trying to do our little bit、um, professionally, and obviously, I'll do my best uh, personally. Uh, but it would be really amazing to hear how you go about that at such、uh, high levels、uh, in the world.、Um, I'm really looking forward to what you have、uh, to tell us today. Uh, Melbourne is a great city. I haven't been there, but I know it's a great city. So, good, good to see the skyline behind you. It's beautiful. You'd be very welcome to come. Thank you. And so, I want to kick off the first question with we'll just start straight away, if that's okay with you. Sure.、Um, so, why do you think environmental issues such as climate change has become such a politicized and polarized issue? Um, what is the underpinning of this phenomenon in many countries around the world? First of all, there is absolutely zero reason it should be that way because the environment is not socialist or conservative or liberal.、Uh, it's nothing like that. I mean, the environment is about the future of humankind, and it's a future, the future of Donald Trump, Xi Jinping, you and me, the future of everyone. So there's absolutely no reason why it should be like that. The move from, say, coal energy into solar energy is largely beneficial for everyone, whether on the right or left wing of politics. So it's, it's a pity it has, been,、uh, it has come that way, and we should do everything we could uh, to uh, kind of resettle that situation. There may be a few people who benefit from creating these disturbances and these quarrels, but for most humans, this is just,、uh, uh, just negative. We, sh- we should get out of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. And then the second, question is,、uh, the second question is related to that, which is how can we depoliticize environmental issues、uh, such as climate change in, poli- in politics、um, from countries all over? Because it really shouldn't be a、uh, partisan issue in the first place. No, and please remind yourself that environmentalism in the beginning was a conservative cause. It was the labor movement and the left who kind of 
challenged environment and wanted to move very fast into industries and to create pollution, while conservative forces in the UK wanted to care of their, uh, their entities, their farms uh, and nature. So it, it historically was a conservative cause. And now it has been turned into a battle for absolutely no reasons. Uh, and I think the way out of this is to focus on what, what, what can uni 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 unify us. Because protecting tigers or elephants uh, or the beauty of the Rocky Mountains or the beauty of the deserts of, of uh, um, uh, Australia, who can be against that? No one is. So it's just about finding the right methods uh, to do this protecting us against dangerous climate change, getting out of the pollution. If you go to the great Indian cities, say Delhi or Mumbai, everyone is suffering from the pollution. Rich people and poor people, people on the left side, on the right side, whether they are with the conservative uh, part of the BJP or with the, with the more center part of the Congress, they're all suffering from pollution, all want to get out of it. So we, we simply need to uh, kind of Re, re change the con uh, conversation into what, what, what unifies us and environment should be a great unifier and not, not a, a way of splitting people. I think the way to create unity is to focus on the win-win-win policies. All those policy options which are good for Mother Earth and the environment, good for jobs and prosperity, and good for people and health at the same time. There are so many such. I mean, if we move from a very big focus on, on uh, coal or, or um, uh, fossil fuels into wind and uh, solar and clean powers. Well, it's good for our health, good for modern earth, but it's also creating many more jobs. Uh, the same if you move into a more sustainable tourism. Tourism can be a great vehicle to take care of the environment and, and the beauty of, of modern earth. And it can be done in an environment sustainable fashion. And it's one of the biggest job creators on planet Earth because it, it, it takes any number of people to start just a small hotel or restaurant. While of course you can, you can create a big factory producing automobiles basically by robots. But no hotel can work just with robots. So tourism creates any number of jobs. So focusing on all those solutions, which are win-win-win, good for environment, good for economy, and good for health and people at the same time. There are so many such available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you so much. And next, I want to uh, get into disability advocacy. You shared with me in one of our first emails that you worked for a disability advocacy organization. And uh, so I was delighted to hear that. So can you share with us what prompted you to pursue that kind of work and, and stay with it for two years? Well, this, this was my first actual job outside uh, politics. I've been engaged with the uh, political movement for, for all my youth. And then I wanted to do some real job. Uh, and I worked for the Norwegian Association of the, on the Handicapped or the Disabled, which is the main organization for the physically disabled. It's not uh, organizing mentally disabled or, or blind or, or other groups of handicaps, but all, all the physical handicapped. And, we were running a number of projects uh, with African nations to establish sister organizations to help African organizations of the disabled and to run fact uh, workshops, producing wheelchairs or, or workshops simply with the aim of, uh, of create, create, creating job opportunities for disabled people. So it was a great learning curve for me. Yeah, so in that position at the, Norwe the Norwegian Association of the Disabled, correct? Um, what were some things that you accomplished over those two years that you were especially proud of? I think it was to see the happiness uh, of uh, quite a few people with, with disability who got an opportunity to, to, to provide something in society because with that comes self-respect and dignity uh, and they are seen as not just a burden to society. I remind yourself when you are in an African country, you may be poor, you may have a number of children, the tendency then to put the handicapped or disabled children last in the queue, you feed the others first, you give them the equipment first, maybe the toys first, and then something to the handicapped at the last, and the handicapped will also tend to be the last to go to school. Uh, so simply to make, make it possible for handicapped people to contribute to society and gain the respect to others, which is so key for self-respect also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is so crucial. And uh, yeah, having, uh, I grew up in, uh, 
in an uh, orphanage in China. So I know that how crucial a wheelchair is for uh, people with disabilities, especially um, as you were saying, um, you know, toys and other things are donated, but then people, kids with disabilities are often forgotten and, and the resources that are needed are also forgotten as well. So that's really important work. Thank you. I, I, Next. I, 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 I may add that we were focusing very intensely on low tech equipment because there were so many examples of people in the West sending the most high tech equipment to Africa and it may work for, for a while, but if the road is much more dumpy than the road is in Washington DC, it may uh, start getting destroyed very fast and there's simply no one there to, to repair it. So to create uh, wheelchairs and a huge number of other uh, artificial limbs, whatever it may be, who can, can be sustained under the technical uh, circumstances. In, in that case, it was like nations like Tanzania and Ghana and Uganda. Uh, was key to success. Otherwise, it would, you would simply waste the money, send something, and it lasts for half a year, and then uh, it's gone. Yeah, exactly. They don't have the resources in those developing countries to get a new phone or a new wheelchair every six months to a year, right? So it has to really be durable. Um, and uh, so next, I want to cover the intersectionality between uh, climate change and disability, which mm -hmm. I uh, told you about earlier. So for certain people, for people with certain kinds of disabilities, drinking with pl plastic straws are the most effective method. But the big problem with all this is that a plastic straw ban will take away a safe, hygienic, and cheap way to have, to have a drink for people with disabilities that has no real alternatives. And before you say, but what about, believe that people with disabilities have already thought of whatever you are suggesting. Paper, silicon, and metal are all just some of the suggested um, alternatives, as though people with disabilities ha had never considered them in the first place. So the negative side of these other types of straws range from choking hazards, to being too costly for consumers, to not being safe enough to use in high temperatures. Um, instead of coming up with harmful, harmful actions for the for the disability community, such as banning single-use straw, plastic straws all across the board, or declaring as asthma inhalers are in damage damaging to the environment, how do we include people with disabilities in all environmental discussions so that we can understand the needs of all groups uh, involved and reduce the use of plastic, that reduce the use of plastics in intelligently? So after all, I'm sure you know, people with disabilities are 20% of the world's population, making us one of the largest, if not the largest, minority group in the world. No, absolutely. I mean, the key is basically brought forward by the uh, person asking this question, him or herself, because that's to include people in the discussion so that their needs can be taken uh, in, in, into account. And true, I mean, I'm sure that very rarely uh, the need of a small group of disabled in, in this case is taking into the discussion about uh, plastics. But of course, the wide, vast majority of disabled themselves don't need straws. Uh, it's people with some specific disabilities. But I tend to take the view that as you're, you're not providing hearing aids for everyone, you're providing hearing aids for that, those with hearing disabilities, uh, providing uh, contact lenses for people like myself who, who need that and the same is the case here if, if some people need a straw they should be of course provided with a straw and every okay. restaurant could provide a straw to those who ask specifically for it rather than providing it to everyone so people tend to, of course to look into the issues they are very familiar uh, uh, with uh, and may not take into account issues like this so, so the issue is to bring everyone into the discussion so that we can find solutions which works for everyone Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, so the next question is, according to the UNEP, I don't know if this was, this statement was put out when you were there or your predecessor. Um, so according to the UN Environment Program, mm -hmm. uh, disabled people will, I'm quoting, uh, disabled people will be disproportionately disadvantaged by climate change. The, they highlight three specific issues uh, and outcomes that could be devastating to disabled people. Firstly, disabled populations will have limited access to resources, 
service and knowledge about effectively resp responding to environmental change. Secondly, disabled people often have compromised health, which makes them more vulnerable to extremes in climate, ecosystem losses, and infectious diseases. Thirdly, disabled people, as mentioned above, are more likely to struggle with evacuations or enforced migrations. How can we better include people with disabilities when responding to and preparing for disasters? I think the answer is very much the same as the previous question. You need to include people in the discussion to, to in the pre preparedness. And of course, uh, one dilemma is that uh, disabled people is not one, one specific group. People have all sorts of disabilities. They are in very different situations and some some disabled people are very resourceful, uh, highly well-paid, living in the most plush environments in the big cities of, the, of Western Europe or Australia or US, while other disabled people are living in extreme poverty and difficulties. But overall, on average, disabled people tend to be more vulnerable. They tend also to be a little bit poorer because they have less ability, in many cases, to provide an income. And of course, they may have difficulties moving fast if there is a situation of evacuation and they may have more so-called underlying uh, conditions which may make it, make it difficult. So while there are so many varieties of this, uh, yes, disabled people are in a, a particularly vulnerable situation towards climate change and their voice needs to be heard loudly in the discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. So the next questions follow along the same lines. According to Forbes, approximately 150,000, 155,000 disabled people and elderly were affected by Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Survivors of the hurricane included people with visual and physical impairments and learning disabilities. Uh, approximately half uh, the deaths from Hurricane Katrina were people over the age of 75. A large number of these had disabilities and health conditions that increased their vulnerability. Uh, what pre preventative measures can the U.S. or other countries uh, who face similar situations do to avoid the catastrophes of Hurricane Katrina? I know you folks focus on a, a more international level, at least at the time when you were the executive, executive director of the UNEP. I think a key role is uh, the kind of philosophic, philosophical underpinning. Uh, we should help everyone. We should help everyone, even if they are severely disabled, even if they have huge difficulties, even if they are very old. Uh, some of the most disturbing voices I've heard during the COVID-19 epidemic is those people saying that, does it really matter if a 75-year-old person dies? Yes, it, it matters. I mean, if a 75-year-old person is sailing outside the coast of the US and uh, get into a storm, <laughs> we send all sorts of resources to try to uh, to salvage that person. Uh, if a 80 year old person is in trouble in the traffic again, we will do everything to, to help him or her. Uh, a 70, 75 year old person in most developed nations, as well as in places in China, will on average have 20 years more to live. And these 20 years could be years of low, uh, amazing experiences, achievements. Uh, so we should do everything we can to provide for everyone whatever age, whatever disability, and whatever condition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, thank, thank you. Um, so the last question under this category is about the mm -hmm. bushfires in Australia. So during the recent bushfires in, in Australia, it became apparent that disabled people were the most vulnerable in emergency situations. As people affected by uh, by the bushfires were urged to en enact their fire plan, the needs of disabled people were not considered. Needs such as access accessible eva evacuation centers, transport for, for the individual and any essential, essential equipment, they need to manage their impairment and health conditions, information and formats that they can read and, and understand, especially for the deaf community and related, for example, communication tools um, for deaf, as I was saying, and visually impaired. So again, who and what actions needs to be taken to mitigate these problems and prevent these perfectly avoidable deaths if we plan ahead of time? Granted, we need to plan 
uh, much, much more ahead of time as a lot of these things require a lot of time, just like evacuation centers, you know, the structures, infrastructures need a lot of time to um, assess and see what's possible. In the midst of the situation, we need to enforce the view that everyone is valuable, everyone should be helped, everyone should be saved. Uh, so that, that's very clear. But then, of course, we need to prepare, and then need to prepare in particular for those most vulnerable. Uh, the older people are, the more likely they are to have different sorts of handicaps. So old age and handicap is also coming together to some extent. But we need to bring the different associations of disabled into the um, to the conversation, representatives of disabled, because what's right for deaf people or for blind people or for people with physical handicaps or mental handicaps is not necessarily the same. <laughs> so you need to prepare for a wide, wide variety of different issues. And the only way to do that properly is to bring those closest to the issue into the discussion at an early stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so next, we're going to jump on to more general climate change questions, okay? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So what are some of the, what were some of the biggest consequences or what are some of the biggest consequences of the U.S. Pull, pulling out of the uh, Paris Climate Agreement for the rest of the world and also for the U.S. itself? Fortunately, the consequences, at least in the short run, is much less than people think because it's the President of the United States taking the U.S. as a country out of the climate talks, while so much is simply continuing in the U.S. States like California, New York, and many other states are moving well ahead. Business is moving ahead. It was, I remind yourself, there was not one big company in the U.S. which raised its hand and said, oh, we agree with the President in, on this. Every company of any significance said, no, we disagree with this. We want to take climate action. Look at a huge company like Microsoft that just said that not only we will be carbon negative by 2030, which is in itself great, but they will even compensate for all emissions during the 50 years of existence of Microsoft. Uh, it's, it's huge. And of course, Microsoft in itself is much bigger than many small nations in the world. It is one of the 10 biggest companies, but the emissions of Microsoft is much, much bigger than an average small nation in, in the world. And that's just one company. President Trump is all, all days, every year, speaking about, about uh, the benefits of coal, but he's not able to convince any investor to invest in coal. All the investors believe that the future is in solar and wind. In the midst of COVID-19, even the Trump administration had to accept the biggest solar plant ever anticipated in the United States. It's just outside Las Vegas. It will provide electricity to those working in the gambling halls of Las Vegas. Uh, and it's a huge solar entity. Why is this? Well, the investors believe in solar. No one is ready to put the money in the declining industry of coal. So uh, you, you have seen now even the United States doing better than anticipated than the Obama administration when it comes to the move into green uh, ele electricity, simply because the market forces is taking the lead rather than the president. Hopefully we'll get a president uh, in, after November who will take climate change seriously. But even without efforts from climate change, fortunately a lot of positive will happen in the United States of America. And of course with China, India, Europe, uh, we can provide a global leadership which can take the issue forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hopefully. Um, so I'm glad the, the consequences aren't as dire as you know, as some may have predicted. So with so many, the next question, with so many uh, leaders in high positions not believing in, you know, the glaring science and facts and, and denying the existence of climate change even, um, how do everyday people in the public get ready for the consequences, um, the inevitable consequences of climate change, um, such as increased droughts, wild, wild uh, fires, abnormal weather patterns. Um, if, if we don't take action, and uh, as you know, so many in the U.S., so many po politicians in the U.S., as you know, deny the existence and see it all as a hoax, um, the consequences are going to be inevitable. So how can we, everyday citizens, prepare for what's to come? I think the Republican Party in the U.S. should do some self uh, ransacking their history. I mean, it was Richard Nixon 
conservative Republican anti-communist president who established uh, the Environment Protection Agency. It was Ronald Reagan who signed the Montreal Protocol uh, to stop the enormously dangerous uh, destruction of the ozone layer. And it was George W. Bush who take ma took a major step forward uh, to clean the air in the United States. So up to very recent, and John McCain, by the way, a uh, great leader of the Republican Party, was a strong climate activist. So the Republican Party has a long green history. It was Theodore Roosevelt who established the national park system in the United States. So why don't the Republican Party go back to its history and find these green roots and start putting water to these roots? So this is simply zero reason why a conservative American should oppose what is dear to the children and grandchildren, which is the enormous beauty of America and the safety of its people. Mm -hmm. And uh, as for the as for the general public, what, what can we do? Yeah, that's of course the danger and a few political leaders. I mean, let's not, let's not exaggerate because I'm not aware of more than two significant global leaders, that President Trump and President Bolsonaro of Brazil. Those are the two only global leaders of any significance who deny the seriousness of climate change. All the others, President Xi of China, Prime Minister Modi of India, European leaders like Merkel, um, Macron, uh, Boris Johnson in the UK, Putin, they all accept that climate change is a real issue. The real problem is not those two who don't believe in this. The pr real problem is that the rest of us are not acting fast enough. I think we all know the direction we need to go, that we need to go much faster. And the key to achieve that is to look into all these win-win propositions, which are good for the economy, providing jobs, while good for the environment at the, at the same time. And they're all available, uh, and they're happening now also. Uh, a key factor is the price of coal, which has come in the the price of coal is now compared to wind and solar so high that basically everywhere in the world it's better for jobs, better for the economy and better for the environment to move from coal into solar and wind. So we should just do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, so Jean is going to ask you some questions now. Okay. Hi, Jean. <laughs> Hi, Eric. Um, actually, that was a very good uh, lead in to my question, which I guess is about the triple bottom line, the win, win, win. Mm -hmm. um, so my question today comes from uh, the perspective of smart development of cities. So uh, the question is, how can the faster growing cities of the world, um, who usually follow in the footsteps of the developed countries, avoid repeating the mistakes that the, that the developed countries made? Um, for example, ending up with concrete cities with poor quality outcomes for the people who inhabit them. Uh, examples uh, could include uh, LA, Dubai, and even Melbourne. Um, Melbourne has a lot of skyscrapers which have a lot of glazing face in the sun uh, without much um, proper uh, or, or effective uh, solar protection. Um, apart from that, there's also uh, issues with design such as uh, steps and staircases without ramps, um, heat islands, uh, car dependency, flooding risk, high density living, and the general lack of family services like schools, hospitals, um, and other marketplaces. Um, of course, the, the opposite, uh, which we would want to see in a, in a smart developing city, uh, of course, are the ramps uh, for uh, better access a 20 minute walking city, improved air quality, low crime, good laneway culture, especially like Melbourne, that's what we really value in, in our city, like the cafes and being able to just walk around and enjoy the city. So how can we encourage the developing nations to follow the good instead of ending up with just a, a copy and paste of the bad? I think it's sometimes more useful for developing countries to hold up examples from developing countries as to great behavior because while Melbourne or in Europe, say Copenhagen or Amsterdam uh, or uh, are great, great cities and fantastic, beautiful cities, uh, they still, the argument will always be there that, well, you are so rich, it's easy for you. Let me uh, speak about two developing country cities. One was Singapore, which now is uh, true, a very rich city. That was remarkable with Singapore is that they started taking environment action, but the city was very poor. They started establishing a public transit system, which is brilliant. 
who started to say that you're not allowed to take your car into the city center of Singapore. The founding father of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, even at a very early day, decided to move all the polluting industries away from the Singapore River. So even when Singapore was a very dirty place, the place you would never want to go because it was so uh, heavy on crime and dirt, uh, they started taking environment seriously, and now it's one of the greenest cities in the world. And then move on to, uh, to another very green city, which is Shenzhen, the model city in, in southern China. It's a city of 20 million people, uh, like all the Nordic countries in Europe combined, so it's not a small, small place. They have brilliant green corridors through the city or parks and along the rivers. They have wetlands integrated in the, in, in the city. Every single uh, um, uh, bus in Shenzhen is electric. That is 16,000 electric buses in Shenzhen alone. That's, by the way, eight times more electric buses in Shenzhen than in the, all of the continent of Europe, just to give a combination. Every single taxi in Shenzhen is also, by the way, electric. So all these can be difficulties being emulated all over Asia, and a number of Indian cities are trying to go in the same, same direction, for instance, buying huge amounts of electrical buses, as an example. Uh, but Shenzhen and Singapore are two examples of cities who started going green when they were still relatively poor. Fantastic. I'd, I have to read up about all those electric uh, transport options in Shenzhen. I didn't realize uh, it was it's so... Simply, simply unbelievable. I mean, I, I, the <laughs> latest figure, there was much less than 1,000 electric buses in the United States of America and around 2,000 in Europe and again 16,000 in Shenzhen alone. By the way, there's 6,000 electric buses in Suzhou, another Chinese city also, so Shenzhen is not alone, but it's the prime example of a real green Chinese city. Hmm. Um, actually, uh, me and Ming took an electric bus. Uh, it was my first time in Queensland when she was visiting Australia, and it was actually a pleasure. Um, just being on a, a nice, smooth, advanced uh, bus was actually uh, a real surprise on how, how nice it was. So, Again, that was another win. Um, you know, it, it was enjoyable to take public transport. Indeed. So uh, my next question uh, is about uh, transitioning. Uh, so uh, a lot of my friends were asking um, about which cities have demonstrated a, politi a politically successful transition to a carbon trading system or alternative system. And uh, is this still necessary given the recent trends in the adoption of renewables? Uh, carbon trading, you said? Yeah. Yes. I think carbon trading overall need to be on a larger scale than a city alone can provide because the most important carbon trading system has been the Euro European, which is basically applied uh, across the European Union. There has also been uh, experiments with carbon trading in other parts of the world, like in China and Korea and other parts of the world. And I, I think carbon trading is a fant fantastic uh, idea because it's, uh, it provides a more efficient uh, system. It should, by the way, be a system uh, close to the heart of American conservatives because it puts a price on what you don't want, which is uh, pollution, while bring, bringing back to the same people uh, the money. So it's not a way of uh, creating money, money for, the, for, the, for the government. So carbon trading is good, but it cannot it can only be the, the it cannot it cannot be the only solution. And creating a global carbon trading system will be very challenging because of competition issues and and the lack of lack of trust at the moment uh, between the main main players, in particular the United States and, uh, and China. Very interesting. Um, and the, the next question is about uh, the oceans, specifically about climate change induced deoxygenation of the oceans and how it could decimate many ocean species of plants and animals. Do you think there is a need for something similar to a seed bank style initiative to preserve uh, the future of sea life? There is a huge amount of, uh, of uh, initiatives to try to protect the oceans better. Um, I think your nation, Australia, is uh, also in the lead here because of course the Great Barrier Reef is the the greatest uh, reef and maybe the greatest uh, area of oceans anywhere in the world. And when you speak to the experts in Queensland and, uh, and in universities of Australia, they all say the sea temperature is the key. Uh, one degree change in sea temperature is uh, damaging for for the for the for the um, uh, for the reefs. 
Some reefs may be more resilient in other parts of the world, but particularly in the Great Barrier Reef, we have enormous trouble just from one degree change in the sea temperature. Then we need to look into other ways of restoring reefs. I know there are a lot of experiments on that. So far, they have been mainly successful in small scale, but we really need to look into whether there are ways by, by, by providing seeds um, uh, and other ways to, to restore reefs uh, at, at scale. And overfishing is another main threat to oceans. Uh, so we need to protect oceans in many, and pollution, plastic pollution is a new big threat, which we didn't really realize until a few years back. I mean, uh, turtles, whales, uh, seabirds are eating a lot of plastic and it, it's very destructive to their digesting system and many, many die from horrible deaths. I mean, there was a whale in Thailand earlier this year. It was vomiting plastic bags while succumbing. Uh, it was so disgusting to see. Yeah, we certainly have a lot of uh, work to protect the future of our oceans. So, yeah. Um, so I have a couple more climate change related questions and then we'll move on to other topics, Eric. Um, so as you know, the youth, the young population are very passionate about this issue, um, you know, climate change. So how can we mobilize and harness that passion to create lasting policy change um, at the local, national, international levels? I think young, young people is in the forefront on the climate struggle for the very obvious reason. I mean, most of the I mean, wild climate change is here and now. I mean, they had huge bush, bush fires in Australia earlier this year, which is partly caused by, by climate change as an example. So it's a here and now issue, but of course, the main impacts of climate change will be later, and people who will, will expect to live to the end of the 21st century will, of course, be much more impacted by climate change. So that's why people are so, uh, so much concerned. But at the end of the day, it should be an issue for everyone. Older people have children and grandchildren, uh, and young people will be there to, to see it. So uh, we need to mobilize everyone and to make major impact. Again, triple wind solutions are more likely to take fire because they provide a better livelihood here and now, while uh, and the prosperity people need. Remember that still many people or most, mo I mean, many people are very poor on the planet, and most people are not very rich. Uh, so we need also to take care of people's economy, but the good news is we can do that and uh, attack climate change at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so uh, with uh, policymakers and especially, you know, as a UNEP ED member, executive director member, um, how, how do we um, use that power that the passion the youth has right now? To, to their advantage, to the politicians' advantage, to UN appointees' advantage, um, to create systemic uh, change? I believe the environment movement should change a little bit. It's sometimes too dull, sometimes too pessimistic, focusing in on all the problems. By and large, people know that the situation is dire and that they need to change. So that's not the need to repeat that over and over again. What's really the need of the hour is the optimistic message. Here is what we can do to get out of the problems. And please follow me <laughs> to get out of the problems, to get into the new technologies, to create the business opportunities, to put the pressure on the political leaders so that they act much more uh, convincingly. Mm -hmm. we, cannot, we cannot bore people into action, and nor can we scare them into action. I'm much more likely to inspire them into action. Mm -hmm. um, and you are an optimist, as we all know. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think you need to convince Jean into the group as well. I'm an mm -hmm. optimist as well. Mm -hmm. um, so you once wrote, our planet is vulnerable, but I'm optimistic we can resolve the environmental problems we face. There's little we can't achieve, I'm quoting you, of course. Um, there's little we can't achieve when we pull together with cooperation, collaboration, and a can-do attitude, unquote. So what currently existing scientific facts make you come to this conclusion and be so optimistic about the future? The main cause of my optimism is my interest in history. Because yeah, I've seen so many examples of how we create great movements to change society. When you can look to the, the biggest ones, say, in the United States of America, slavery was normal in the US, it was normal all over the world. 
Then a few people start picking up the fight. And one astonishingly, the ABM Lincoln decided and, and fought the fight to them. And to the, to the, now that there's no legal slavery anywhere in the world. In the, even the small things are relatively small. I mean, 15 years back, smoking was allowed basically in every single restaurant on planet Earth. Now, wherever you go, we have a huge difficulty finding one restaurant where you're allowed to smoke. Why was that? Well, a small European country called Ireland decided we want to wipe out sm smoking in restaurants in Ireland. At the time, the brewery industry said we will go broke if this happened. The restaurant said, no, 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 it can, nev can never happen. No one will come to visit a restaurant if they're not allowed to smoke. Well, they did it, and none of these uh, doomsayers were proven right. And uh, by the inspiring example of Ireland, everyone else has followed. And you, even in the deepest of the jungles, fur furthest out in the deserts or in the most dark corners or in the big cities on the city in the world, they're not allowed to smoke any longer. It's taken 15 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, those are, those are all such great examples for um, something that could, improvements that could happen into the future and on environmental issues as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that really thoughtful response. And thank you for giving us a whole hour, a little over an hour, actually. I know you're a busy man, a senior advisor, a governor, a CEO, and, and another form of an advisor. So I don't know how you can get any busier. Um, but thank you so much for still making time for our podcast. Um, I really appreciate it, Eric. So hi. Thank you so much. Great to be with you and enjoy that. Morning in Washington and the evening in Melbourne. And afternoon in Oslo, Oslo. Norway. Yep. The whole day represented. <laughs> That's true. Did you like this video? If so, share with your friends and be sure to follow us on social media. And if you want even more resources, be sure to sign up for our email updates on our website, traipsingglobal.com. Keep learning new perspectives. Keep being inclusive because it will make the world a better place for you and for everyone else. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you on another episode of the Trips and Global on Wheels podcast hour.